Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the 2017 George J. Mitchell Distinguished International, International Lecture. I'm Dan Shea, Director of the Goldfarb Center for Public Affairs and Civic Engagement and Professor of Government here at Colby. I'd like to tell everyone to shut off their phones. <laughs> Uh, I'm guilty of that sometimes too, but if we, that's actually a good, good prompt to shut off our phones. Um, I'd like to expand, extend a special welcome to Senator King, to Senator George Mitchell, members of the Mitchell Nail families, our many, commu many community friends, Colby faculty, students, staff, and administrators. The George J. Mitchell lecture series is designed to bring prominent leaders to Colby to foster interaction with students, faculty, and members of the greater Waterville community while honoring native, Waterville native George Mitchell. The series was launched by the generous contributions from the Mitchell family members and friends of the centers who agreed that it was important to bring high profile speakers to central Maine. My role tonight is to briefly introduce Senator Mitchell who will then introduce our guest speaker. You know, it's been said that the more famous the speaker, the shorter the introduction. If that's true, my remarks about Senator Mitchell would be very brief indeed. Surely the residents of Waterville in the state of Maine and the entire nation know of his career as a prosecutor and a federal judge. They are aware of his distinguished work in the Senate, his successes as a negotiator in Northern Ireland and the Middle East. They also know he was chairman of that rather small little enterprise called Walt Disney Corporation. And many of us have read one or more of his five books, including his most recent volume, The Negotiator. And of course, hundreds of college students across the state, including many in this room tonight, appreciate the difference that the Mitchell Institute Scholarship has made in their lives. But if you don't mind, I'd like to say just a few words about what I believe Senator Mitchell's approach to public service, a model that is too infrequently found these days. Throughout his career, from the early days in the Senate to the creation of the Bipartisan Policy Center, George Mitchell has shown that public servants can have strong convictions. They can be ideologically, they can be proud partisans. But the true duty of public servants, however, is to understand that those on the other side also have strong convictions and that deserve respect. Senator Mitchell's career exemplifies a cherished American ideal that humility and a willingness to compromise reveals strength, not a weakness. His career has been built on the idea of rigor analysis, reason, negotiation, and respectful dialogue can solve even the most seemingly insurmountable problems. Please welcome Senator George Mitchell. leading the Goldfarb Institute and being the organizer of uh, this event. I'm very grateful to you and to Sandy Mazel, who preceded you in that position uh, for the tremendous devotion to making uh, this lecture series a success that is due largely to your efforts. So I hope all of you will join me in thanking Dan and Sandy for their efforts. I grew up in Waterville, and so I've known of and been involved in, with Colby my entire life. Uh, we in Waterville and the whole Colby community have been fortunate to have a series of great leaders who've continually built upon the successes of the past and improved both the institution for those who learn here and the relations with the community in which the college is located. Uh, and uh, as great as have been his predecessors, I have to say that uh, 
both Kobe and Waterville hit the jackpot when Dave Green came to Kobe as president. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I want personally, in behalf of all of the people of Waterville and for the future generations of citizens of this great community and those involved with Kobe now in the future to thank Dave for the tremendous leadership that he has demonstrated uh, with respect to Kobe, with respect to Waterville and the entire Central Maine community. It is truly leadership at its finest and I've pledged to Dave my full and unstinding support and I know that everyone here feels the same way. So on behalf of the people of Waterville, present and future, thank you so much, Dave, for all that you're doing for our community. Uh, I want also to thank uh, all of the members of my family who have uh, supported me personally and supported this program uh, several of them are here this morning, uh, this evening, and uh, I do want to mention my sister and true brothers, uh, because as I said at an earlier event, if I don't mention them, they're going to give me a really hard time. Uh, uh, they've come to believe that these programs are about them, and I keep trying to tell them, no, that's not the case. They're still not convinced. Uh, my oldest brother, Paul, who is here, has been uh, an inspiration and a guide to me all of my life. He was the first born in our family, and my mother called him Sunshine every day of his life. Uh, that made the rest of us feel somewhat under a cloud. Uh, uh, so there was a kind of a natural uh, competition, but he has guided and led me in my life as well as the rest of our family. So. I'm very grateful to Paul for coming. Uh, also here is my sister Barbara, who has been a great supporter and contributor uh, to Kobe, uh, and uh, one of the strongest members of our family. I, I mentioned earlier that once we had a fight, there were four brothers and Barbara. And my brother Robbie said, well, the four of us against Barbara, it's an even fight. <laughs> and that's about the way it turned out. She prevailed as usual. And finally, in connection with Kobe, uh, we have two strong family connections. My father was a janitor here at Kobe for the last 15 years of his working life. Uh, he loved it. He himself did not have an education, but he loved being around educational institutions and books and readings. Uh, and uh, for a while, I thought he imagined himself as the president of the college himself. He talked about it so often. Uh, but. He loved it and we began a long and warm, friendly family relationship and for many decades, my brother Johnny, who as everybody knows as the famous Swisher is truly the greatest member of our family, coached here at Kobe. He'll be recognized at, at an event uh, coming up this Saturday. Uh, I'd like to recognize him here now, my brother Johnny. Stand up Johnny for everybody. Uh, I, I do have to tell one story about Johnny. Uh, uh, very early in my life, when Johnny was the star basketball player at Waterville High School, won the New England championships, was most valuable player. Everybody knew who he was. Paul and my brother Rob were great athletes. I came along and I was not as good an athlete as my brothers. In fact, I was not as good as anybody else's brother. So very early in life here in Waterville, I began to be known as Johnny Mitchell's kid brother, the one who isn't any good. As you might expect, I developed a massive inferiority complex and a highly competitive attitude toward my brothers. Frequently now, as I travel around the world, I'm interviewed and people ask me, what is the highlight of my life? Now they think about Northern Ireland or Senate Majority Leader, stuff like that, and truly my answer, the highlight of my life was the day that I was elected to the United States Senate for the first time. I'd been appointed to the Senate. I wasn't 
seen as having much chance to be elected, but I was lucky and was able to win. On that evening, there was a big celebration, the typical election night scenario at a hotel in Portland with a very large crowd. The stage was jammed, uh, and when I came down to give my acceptance speech, I could hardly work my way across the stage. My daughter, Andrea, who's here, was there with her mother and my wife, and they had been shoved aside by Johnny, who occupied the spot right where I'm standing next to the microphone. He's very dangerous for any of you to get between him and a camera or a microphone. <laughs> uh, and so as I got up to speak, my wife and daughter had been pushed aside, and my brother draped his arm around me. And I literally gave an acceptance speech with this guy hanging on to me. Uh, and the next day, the Portland paper ran a big picture on the front page. And the caption said, Senator George Mitchell celebrating his surprise election victory, being cheered on by an unidentified supporter. <laughs> Now, now, I don't want to go on too long, but I have to tell a compensatory story to show how famous he really was. Years later, I was the majority leader of the United States Senate, and I was in Miami to speak at an event, and I received a telephone call from the owner of the Miami Heat professional basketball team. The Boston Celtics were playing in Miami that night, and so he invited me to go to the game, which I did. And the Celtics were playing, and at that time, Bob Cousy, who was a very famous player at Holy Cross in college and then with the Boston Celtics, was the television commentator, the color man, as they call him on TV. And after the game, we were walking across the gym floor, and the owner said to me, well, there's Bob Cousy. He said, you must know him. I said, no, I don't know him. I, I know of him, of course. I'm a basketball fan. He said, well, come on, I'll introduce you to him. So we went over to Cousy, and the owner said to Cousy, he said, uh, this is Senator George Mitchell. And Cousy looked at me with a blank look on his face. He said, well, do, do you represent Dade County or, or Broward County in the Florida Senate? And the owner said, no, 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 he's, he's the majority leader of the United States Senate. And Cousy still looked at me with a blank face. And so I said to him, I'm Johnny Mitchell's brother. He said, you're the Swisher's brother? <laughs> he came over, he gave me a big hug. He hung on to me like Velcro until we get out of the gym and we traded stories about how great my brother Johnny is. So I want to end on a positive note with a great picture. Uh, now I better get to the introduction uh, because the the U.S. Constitution prohibits cruel and unusual punishment, but it does not define the term. But I define it to mean that no crowd should ever have to listen to speeches by two senators in the same evening. So I'm going to now limit myself to the introduction uh, of our guest speaker, uh, Senator Angus King. Uh, as we all know, Senator King has represented the people of Maine in the United States Senate uh, with great distinction uh, and ability. Before that, he served for eight years as our governor, very successfully in a difficult time, uh, and he is truly making a national reputation for himself. Uh, we've been privileged in Maine to have Angus now leading our state and representing us in the Senate for many years, and so we tend to get used to it, but I think it's we should remember how fortunate we are that he is a person of unusual uh, ability and distinction. I think the best compliment I can pay to him occurred to me just a week ago. I was in the CNN studio in New York, and they, they have a room where you wait till you go on. It's called the green room in all of these television studios. And I was sitting in the green room waiting to be interviewed, and there comes Angus on the screen uh, being interviewed in Washington, D.C. And he talks for a few minutes, and there was a woman who was a guest uh, 
not in, on political matters, on economic matters, sitting there by me and watching. And after a few minutes, she said, do you know him? I said, oh yes, I know him very well. He's a senator from my state. She said, you know, he's so, and she hesitated, he's so, she said, he's so Maine. <laughs> and I think that's about it. I said to her, that's a, yeah, I said, you may not be aware of it, that's as good a compliment as you can pay to anyone from Maine as possible. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming my guest, Soul Maine, Angus King. <laughs> that's a great story. Is that a true story? <laughs> it is a true story. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thanks, George. I don't know whether to speak or preach. <laughs> when I was about 15 years old, my dad took me to uh, New York for a weekend, and we went. We ended our trip on Sunday at a, a big, uh, fancy Episcopal church on Fifth Avenue. And in the Episcopal liturgy, liturgy there's a place in the, in the communion service where the, the preacher says, uh, let us give thanks unto the Lord. And the congregation responds, it is meet and right so to do. And in my church, where I grew up, you responded. It is meet and right, so to do. In this big, fancy church in New York, people said, it is meet and right, so to do. <laughs> and you couldn't barely hear him. My dad, who was this very big guy, turned to me in a stage whisper, and you could hear it all over the church, maybe they don't think it's meet and right, so to do. <laughs> so whenever I get into a preaching situation, I, I, I think about that. Uh, I, I'll tell, I, I love George's story, and I'll tell you a compliment to that, a complimentary story that I think is really a compliment for Maine. Susan Collins and I both sit on the Intelligence Committee, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, but we both sit on the Intelligence Committee, and one day she was uh, arguing and debating about a, an amendment that she had, and I sit next to a guy named Martin Heinrich, who's a senator uh, from New Mexico. And in the middle of her comments, he leaned over to me and said, is there something in the water in Maine that gives people common sense? <laughs> I thought that was about as good as it gets. For It was a compliment to me, to Susan, but mostly to Maine. So that, that's an absolutely true story. Okay, what I want to talk about tonight is, is, is about foreign policy. And I could talk all night about Russia. I could talk all night about Syria. I could talk all night about North Korea. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk about more general thoughts about foreign policy from the point of view of someone who has really had an immersion in it in the last four years. Before that, I was governor of Maine. Now, I was qualified to work on foreign policy because we all know from Maine you can see Canada. <laughs> So, some of you may have to explain that to some of today's students, but uh, uh, t time goes by. But when I got to Washington, uh, I, uh, you, you, you get uh, your committee assignments, and I said, the, I, I said to Harry Reid, the Democratic leader, the only committee that I really want to be on and need to be on is armed services. Maine has had a senator on the Armed Services Committee with one break, I think, in the 70s, continuously for about 80 years, going back to the 40s, going back to Margaret Chase Smith, as a matter of fact. And so I said, I really want to be on the Armed Services Committee. We've got uh, uh, Bath Ironworks. We've got the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. It's a very important issue for Maine. So put me there, and you can do whatever else you want. You can put me wherever else you want. So I got a call. You're on Armed Services. You're also on budget, you're on rules, and you're on intelligence. So all of a sudden, this guy who's a former governor from Maine is in the middle of all of these foreign policy issues because of being on armed services and intelligence. So I've had an immersion course uh, in foreign policy. So what I'm going to do is not give you, uh, this is, the, I like to do talks that are like one through 10. 
There are two reasons. One is it helps me to organize my thoughts, and two, you know where we are in the speech. Okay? You can always keep track. So here are some thoughts on, on foreign policy. The first thing is it's really complicated. I, in fact, I'm tempted to say nobody knew how complicated it is. <clears throat> Here's an example. Here's an example. In Iran, we're with the Russians against ISIS, and in Iraq, we're with Iran against ISIS, but also in Syria, we're against Assad and the Russians are, again, are for Assad. Do you follow this? I mean, in other words, it's, it's very uh, complex and the relationships differ according to where you are. And, and it's, here's an example about uh, Syria. We talk about what's going on in Syria. You see it on television. You've got Assad. What you've got is a, is a civil war, but you've got about a bunch of civil wars within a civil war. You've got Assad, there are these, you read about, you hear about the opposition to Assad. There are 1,200 opposition groups in Syria, ranging from sort of moderate Syrians who just want to get rid of Assad, all the way over to al-Nusra and, uh, and ISIS, who are radical jihadists. So it's really when you say, well, we're going to help get rid of Assad, the question is, what happens then? and which one of these groups or groups of groups is going to take over. That's one of the things that makes it so uh, really uh, uh, headachey kind of uh, uh, complexity. So it's really complicated. You know, when you play pool, you have a one cue ball and ten, and, and ten balls, and you, you hit them. Foreign policy is more like playing on a big pool table with ten cue balls and a hundred balls. And everything affects everything else. And, and that's what makes it... Uh, so complicated and hard to, uh, uh, to keep track of. Uh, the other piece, and Americans aren't very good about this, the other piece of foreign policy is that it's all about history. And Americans don't have a great sense of history. We think of, of you know, for our history, it's 200 years. In Europe, in the Middle East, 200 years is nothing. I was once in Bulgaria and had dinner with a group of Bulgarians and we were just chatting and somehow the subject of the Turks came up. And my host said, the Turks, oh, we, we hate the Turks. They raped our women, burned our churches, he spit on the floor, you know, we hate the Turks. I said, when did this happen? 1320. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is a 700-year-old grudge. And we don't have that sense. And so that's one of the things that complicates these relationships is the history that we rarely have a full uh, appreciation or cognizance of, and that is another factor that contributes to the, uh, uh, to, the, to the complication. Again, in Syria, or in the Middle East generally, there is an 800-year-old civil war going on in the Middle East between Sunnis and Shiites that uh, it has been going on since the year 800. Did I say, it? I said 800? No, it's a 1,200-year-old civil war between Sunnis and Shiites, and that's involved in a lot of what's going on. ISIS, for example, are Sunni. Iran is a Shiite country, and that's one of the reasons they're in conflict with ISIS. And this, these are conflicts that have been going on for hundreds of years. They're very bitter. And then on top of that, there's a civil war going on in the Middle East between Persians and Arabs. Most people think of, most Americans, at least I did until I started getting into this, you think of the Middle East as an area with Arabs. The Iranians are not Arabs. They're not ethnically Arabs. They are Persians, and they've been fighting with the Arabs since Darius the Great 2,000 years ago. So there's this rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which is historically goes back. It's both Sunni and Shia, but it's also Arab and Persian. The only point I'm trying to make here is that this is really complex stuff, and it's things that we, we need to understand better when we decide to stick our hand in and try to take a role in some of these issues. And the key to it, it seems to me, is to clearly define what our interests are. Okay, two. Foreign policy has changed a lot just in the last 10 years. 
the basic way it's changed is that when you always talked about foreign policy, you were talking about countries. The United States, Iran, Syria, North Korea, Russia, France, Germany. Now you've got two other factors, what they call non-state actors, ISIS, Al-Qaeda. These are groups that don't necessarily have a country, although ISIS tried to, but they, they're losing their territory, but are more of an idea and an ideology, but they can be anywhere. And they have a role to play, an important role to play in foreign policy, and it's one that's very hard for us to, to sort of conceptualize because we we're, we're tend to think of countries. For example, after September 11th, we were hit, we were attacked. What's, what do you do when you're attacked? You strike back. The problem was the people who attacked us weren't a country. They were a group of 19 individuals from all over the Middle East, most of them actually, were, I believe were from Saudi Arabia and Yemen and a couple of other countries, but we attacked Iraq. It, it's as if we had attacked Brazil after Pearl Harbor. Do, do you see what I mean? It, 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 was a, it was a vigorous response, but it wasn't the right target necessarily. And, and part of that is our having to understand that there, we're not just talking about other governments and other countries here, we're talking about people. And remember I said there were three, there are state actors, non-state actors, and now we're coping with what I call lone wolves who are not necessarily a member of a group, they may be inspired by a group, they may be somebody sitting in their mother's basement in Peoria, who's online and is self-radicalized and decides to go out and, and kill people at a mall or a nightclub. So that's a whole separate issue from, in other words, and if that happens, there's not a country you can, you can say this is the problem. There, you, you're talking about, radicalized individuals as well as these, uh, these larger sort of organized groups like Al-Qaeda. Um, okay, number three, and this is the one I think is really uh, important and worrisome. I uh, was in uh, Boston a couple of weeks ago and met with a guy named Graham Allison, who's a writer. He wrote the definitive book on the Cuban Missile Crisis. He's a brilliant thinker on foreign policy. And we were talking about the dangerous situation that we're in now. And he said something brilliant because it's what I thought. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> you read a column in the paper and say, they're right. It's because it's what I think. That's called confirmation bias, by the way. <laughs> and we're all victims of it. Anyway, here's what Graham Allison said. He said, what worries me now and what people should be thinking about is Barbara Tuchman's book, The Guns of August, and how wars can start accidentally. The Guns of August is one of the most brilliant books uh, I've ever read. I've read it now three times. It's the story of the beginning of World War I. And President Kennedy actually gave the book to his cabinet, and it, it was a big part of their thinking during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the point of the book is nobody meant for World War I to happen. It was a series of accidents and misunderstandings and, and uh, treaties that were triggered that people didn't expect, and you ended up with a, with a conflagration that killed millions and was a, a world tragedy. And, and that's what worries me about the situation that we're in now. This is what Graham Allison said, that this is what we need to be thinking about, and North Korea. The issue is being sure that we understand each other and that there not be a misunderstanding, that the leader of North Korea doesn't misunderstand a movement of an aircraft carrier as an attack, whereas we think of it as a statement. Do you, do you, do you see what I'm saying? And this gets, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, it gets into cultural differences. But the, the danger of an accident or a miscalculation is what keeps me up at night. In the South China Sea, there's a dispute about who owns the, the, the land, the, not the land, the water, and who controls the South China Sea. And so we have, periodically, we have destroyers that cruise through there, made in Bath, Maine, by the way. And they're an important part of our Navy's asset. And then they'll be buzzed by Chinese fighter pilots. 
what worries me, and I actually asked for a classified briefing just on this subject, what if one of those Chinese pilots makes a mistake and accidentally clips off the top of a destroyer? What happens then? What's the response? And then what's their response? And this is why, to me, one of the most important things that we need to be sure we have in this country is good communications with our adversaries. So we can communicate directly, this was an accident. This isn't an attack. We almost launched our missiles, I believe it was in the 60s, and it turned out to be a flock of geese. And those are the kinds of things that I think are most dangerous. And North Korea is an example of a very dangerous situation that we have to be sure that we're communicating and, and everybody understands uh, what, what these various mes uh, messages are. Uh, one of my favorite movies, uh, and I showed it to one of my kids and he thought, oh, that's an old movie, Dr. Strangelove. Everybody should watch that movie. It's eerily, eerily uh, prescient. And part of it is communication. The, the plot of the movie, not to spoil it for you, is that the Russians built a doomsday machine which would blow up the whole world if there was a nuclear attack of any kind. Uh, and the idea was it was so horrible that it would be a deterrent, that there would never be a nuclear attack because this doomsday machine. They didn't announce that they had the doomsday machine. They wanted to save the announcement for May Day. Meanwhile, a rogue U.S. plane is headed for Russia to drop the bomb, and there's this wonderful scene where Peter Sellers, who plays four or five parts in the movie, is the president, and he's on the phone with the Russian president, and he says, damn it, Dmitry, if you have this thing, you should have told us, because it doesn't act as a deterrent. The point is, communication is absolutely crucial. Okay, number four. Foreign policy includes climate change. National security includes climate change. Climate change is not, not, abs, uh, act, uh, not entirely an environmental issue, it's a national security issue. Here's why. Historically, wars and instability have been driven by things like famines and droughts, lack of food, lack of where people can live, and their various estimates. I, I googled it this morning. By the way, I don't know about you guys, I think it's pretty cool to be alive at the time of the invention of a new verb. <laughs> to Google, you know? Can you imagine being able to tell your grandchildren, I was there when they invented run? <laughs> you know? Well, we were there when they invented Google. The estimates are 100 to 300 million climate refugees in the next 40 years. Just to put it in perspective, the number of refugees from Syria, which has destabilized Europe and, and certainly involved itself in our politics, is like 2 million, 100 million. Imagine the impact of that. Where are those people going to go? They're mostly going to come from around the center of the earth where the temperature is going to be unbearable or where there are droughts and famines, and they're going to be headed north. And we, we being the West, Europe and, and America, and to some extent Asia, are in no way prepared to even think about this. And I think this is something that we have to think about. The Joint Chiefs of Staff believe that climate change is a national security issue. And it's one that we have to take seriously, and it's going to have greater and greater uh, impacts as time goes on. I, I can g do a lot of talking about Greenland and what's happening in Greenland, but the most recent estimate, and I spent uh, some time last August in Greenland, uh, is that we're facing about a foot of sea level rise in the next 15 years, and a foot a decade thereafter for the rest of the century. If you do the math on that, that's about seven feet of sea level rise till the end of the century. One little factoid, Mar-a-Lago is seven feet above sea level. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. The other thing about climate change as a foreign policy issue is it has to be a foreign policy issue. No one country can deal with it. It's got to be, particularly the larger industrialized 
or the developing countries, China and India, are crucial. We cannot expect them. We, we're not going to say to the Indians, sorry, you can't air condition. Or to the Chinese, sorry, you can't have second cars. This has to be a worldwide effort in order to deal with it. And Maine, I can't come back to Maine and say, well, we're going to have to pay twice as much for gasoline because it's going to be doing our bit for climate change if nobody else does. Do, do you see what I mean? It, it has to be a worldwide uh, movement. That's why I believe Paris was so important. And I'm very much hoping uh, that the administration will not back away from Paris because it would unravel what is a promising, not a definitive, but a promising international recognition of the danger uh, of this issue to all of us. Uh, number five, see we're halfway done. <laughs> Leadership is absolutely critical in foreign policy, particularly presidential leadership. Uh, a year and a half ago, no, yeah, about a year and a half ago, remember I mentioned that I'm on the uh, uh, Armed Services Committee and there's a subcommittee of the Armed Services Committee called Strategic Forces. That's a euphemism for nuclear weapons. And as a member of that subcommittee, I went out one day in a little van to Andrews Air Force Base, which is near uh, Washington. There's a funny story about Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, it's, the president often flies in and out of there. And the story that I heard, which I believe, was that Lyndon Johnson once, when he was president, was going out there and a young lieutenant said, uh, Mr. President, your helicopter's right over here. Johnson allegedly said, son, they're all my helicopters. <laughs> And from what I've heard of Johnson, I think that's probably a true story. And anyway, we went out to Andrews and we got on an airplane that I didn't know existed called the NAOC, N-A-O-C, the National Airborne Operations Center. It's otherwise called the Doomsday Plane. And its mission is to be the communications link between the president and our nuclear forces in case of a nuclear attack. And we took off in that airplane and flew out across the country and then flew back uh, to Washington. It was a four or five hour trip. And on the way back, we, they did an exercise as if there was an attack. And the first thing that went up was a clock. In this case, 27 minutes. That's how long the president had to make a decision. And then they had in our earpieces, they were role playing. There was somebody playing the president, somebody playing the secretary of defense, somebody playing you know, the, the, the colonel uh, up, in, up in Alaska uh, with, the, with the information. And you're listening to this, all of this information coming in. And what it came down to, what, sh what shook me physically, my knees were weak when I got off the plane, one person has that decision. We all think of our government as being this sort of herky-jerky, uh, checks and balances, Congress, the Supreme Court, the House, the Senate. No. In this situation, no checks and balances, no Congress, no Supreme Court one person making the decision, and that person is probably in a helicopter being evacuated from Washington. There is no substitute for judgment and, and leadership in that moment. And that's something that we all need to understand. Now, the second part of this story is there are places for Congress to have a role in foreign policy, which they have mostly abdicated. The Constitution, it's really interesting. If you go back to the debates in the Constitutional Convention in Madison's notes on August, I think it was 17th, 1787, they debated the War Power Clause. And there was a group that said, the Congress can never do war. It's too complicated. You can't do war by a committee. The president should have this power. And there were other people that said, we don't want the president to have all the power. That's what the kings of England did, and we didn't like that. And there was quite a vigorous debate they ended up splitting it. The president is the commander in chief, but the Congress declares war. That was the pretty straightforward separation of the authority and it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. The Congress decides whether we should commit the country and then the president executes the war because you can't run a war by committee. The problem is Congress hasn't declared war for, since 1942. Congress doesn't want to hold, to take this responsibility of making these decisions. And right now, we're in this debate about Syria, and my position is we should have that debate, 
the president and the administration to def should define the strategy, but they should come to Congress and say, we need an authorization. Otherwise, we just slide into these things, and right now, we're operating on an authorization that was pa passed eight days after September 11th, and that's still the legal authorization. It has nothing to do with Syria. It has nothing to do with ISIS. It had to do with Al-Qaeda. And we're, it's a generation on, practically, and we, and Congress hasn't done this. Now, you know, you can be critical of the president. This isn't a case where I think this president or President Obama or any former president has taken power. Congress has abdicated it. And it's a difficult thing because, remember, in the presidential campaign, there was a lot of debate about Hillary Clinton voting for the Iraq war. And the object lesson for politicians there is don't vote for or against because they'll come back and bite you in, in some way or another. But I believe that's a responsibility that Congress has, and that's going to be a debate that we're going to be having over the next uh, several weeks. The, the great uh, champion of this in the Congress right now is Tim Kaine of Virginia. And he's the one that believes that we should have some kind of authorization. And he and John McCain, as, as of last week, were working on uh, trying to find uh, how, to, how to word that uh, so it's not entirely open-ended. Uh, Here's a parenthetical about presidential leadership. Unfortunately, historically, foreign adventurism tends to be good short-term politics. The day before the Falklands War, Margaret Thatcher's approval rating was 23%. Two weeks later, it was 70%. I believe it's so that the political science can tell me that President Trump's approval rating bumped up in the last week after the missile strike uh, in, in Syria. Uh, there are examples of this uh, throughout history. Well, Vladimir Putin is, is maintaining his, a lot of his popularity in, in Russia based upon the Ukraine, Crimea, and sort of foreign adventurism. That's, a da that's dangerous when politicians think making war will help them in the next election. And that's something that I think we, uh, we need to be aware of and uh, take great care. Okay. Number six, culture is important too. I think this is one of the greatest problems in American foreign policy, is our lack of knowledge of other people. We think everybody thinks like us. They're European linear thinkers, A, B, C, D. They don't think like us. Their culture is entirely different. I met a fellow, uh, I don't know, it's probably been 10 years ago now, and you know, you meet people and, and where are you from? Well, he said, I was born in Japan. He was American. I said, well, and I did the calculation. I figured it was in like 1947 or something. I said, how'd you happen to be born in Japan? He said, well, my dad was a cultural anthropologist and an expert on, the Japanese, on Japanese history and culture. And General MacArthur hired him to advise him, MacArthur, on how to write the Japanese constitution so it would be consistent with Japanese culture and history. That's brilliant. We don't do enough of that. And that's what I, I think gets us into trouble quite often when we think that everybody thinks like us, everybody wants to do what we want to do, and if we just show them the way, they'll do it. And it doesn't work that way. And you're, again, we're getting involved in these ancient enmities and fights that, that we really don't understand. That's not an argument for just avoiding these issues, but it's an argument for trying to understand them better and to know more about the culture that we're uh, getting involved with before we make these kinds of decisions. Um, number seven. I think in foreign policy today, the real weapons of master destruction are unemployed 22-year-old men all over the world that have no options, no future, and are frustrated and angry and are turning to radicalism. Uh, we had testimony at the Armed Services Committee about two weeks ago, and I can't remember, it was one of the generals, and he said something really interesting. He said, I think it was the AFRICOM commander. He commands the forces in Africa. He said, if we wiped out all the terrorists on Tuesday, they'd all be, there'd be a whole new crop by Friday. And that's something that 
we really need to think about. We cannot kill our way out of this problem. Because remember the, the, the hydra, where you cut off its head and two heads grew back? And that's one of the real challenges, is that we have to talk about what are the, what are the, on, what are the underlying problems that are causing people to turn to this. With ISIS, for example, for a lot of people, it's their first job with pay. ISIS pays pretty well, or it used to. And that's a, that is something that you know we're, we've got to understand. Now, that doesn't mean we can fix all the problems of the world. But another example is the young people coming to the southern border in Mexico, at, at the Mexican border. You know, most of the people that are now coming to the Mexican border are not Mexicans. They're from Central America, particularly Honduras, El, El Salvador, and uh, Honduras, El Salvador, not Costa Rica, Gu Guatemala, Guatemala, and Honduras. They're Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador because they are violent societies. Honduras, I think, has the highest murder rate in the world, and young people particularly are desperately trying to get out of those places, and they took, take this arduous journey through Mexico, and they're trying to get here. Why? Because where they are is a hellhole and they're trying to, to get out. I had an interesting experience. Susan Collins and I went to the Mexican border a couple of years ago to sort of see for ourselves what was going on. And this is a, there's an insight here. We went to this, uh, it wasn't a jail, it was a, it was a reception area, but it was where people were put when they came across the border illegally, and there were a series of cells. And there were families and young people in one. And there was one cell with this one kid who was about 16 years old, and so I went over. I didn't know whether he spoke English, but I said, do you speak English? He said, yes, a little. I said, where are you from? I expected, you know, Honduras or something. I'm, I'm from Bangladesh. How did you get here? He said, well, I, 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 hitchhiked. I got, a, got on a tramp steamer across the Pacific and, and came, near, came through Australia and then went to Ecuador and then to Brazil and then Venezuela and then Honduras. And, you know, he'd been through nine countries and got himself to the American border because he wanted to get here, I turned to the guard and said, we want this guy. <laughs> Keep him, let him in. In 25 years, he'll be president of Procter & Gamble. <laughs> Think of the initiative and the imagination and the courage that that young man had to go through that process. But the point I wanted to make is that it's the, it's the, it's the situation in those countries that's so desperate that's creating this immigration crisis that we have at the southern border. That's why cutting the budget of the State Department makes no sense. It's a huge mistake to be cutting AID and the programs that are trying to make life more tolerable in these various difficult places around the world. General Mattis, who's now the head of the Defense Department, a couple of years ago when he was uh, uh, in, the, in the Joint Chiefs, or I think he was, he was uh, 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 CENTCOM commander, said, if you cut money for the State Department, you're going to have to give me more money for bullets. I thought that was, a, that was a pretty straightforward insight, and it's one that we're going to have to consider as we debate the budget over the next, uh, uh, next few months. Um, by the way, One of the things that we have to be really careful about is not putting all Muslims into the terrorist bucket. They're not. I don't know what the numbers are. Nobody knows. Google will tell you 1%, half a percent. It's still a big number. There are definitely radical Islamist terrorists. There are also about a billion four peaceful Muslims. Mary and I had at our house a couple of years ago a foreign exchange student from Ghana who's a Muslim. She prayed five times a day. She'd never heard of September 11th and thought it was the craziest thing she'd ever heard of. To drive her into the arms of Al-Qaeda is crazy. And so what we have to do, and it's a real challenge, we have to confront terrorism and people who want to do us harm, but do it in such a way that we don't radicalize thousands and millions of other people. And that's one of the great challenges, and it's exactly what ISIS wants us to do. I have a quote in my phone from one of the ISIS publications that, said, that says, what will happen is that the 
the Muslims in the crusader countries, that's what they call us, will be driven to the margins of their society and into our arms. And that's what we can't do. To the extent that we do that, we're doing their work for them. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't confront terrorism, that we don't uh, do everything we can to defend our country. There are people out there right now trying to make bombs that will get onto airplanes. I mean, I'm not minimizing the threat at, in any way. But what I'm saying is we have to be very smart about how we confront that threat and not make the threat greater by growing the body of people who are radicalized and angry. Okay, number eight. Geez, we're almost there. <laughs> Digital and social media is really important, and we're not doing it very well. It's amazing to me that the country that invented Facebook and Hollywood is losing to a bunch of guys in a tent with a laptop. They are doing an extraordinary job of using the internet and social media to recruit, to radicalize, to undermine, and to attack our societies. And we're not at all effective in responding to it. Here's something interesting. In the late 90s, when we thought the world, you know, the end of history and the world was a simpler place and the Soviet Union had fallen apart, we abolished uh, USIA, United States Information Agency, is gone. Turns out that was a big mistake because we have no comprehensive sort of media strategy uh, to deal with this, uh, uh, with this threat. Um, and the next, the next piece uh, ties into that. Uh, the next war is most likely cyber. The next war is most likely cyber. Uh, and it, it's, it's very worrisome. And we keep getting warning shots and not fully responding. Sony Pictures, OPM in Washington, uh, the Russian hacking of our elections, those were all warning shots that we're still sort of fumbling around about. I, I, I get so frustrated in Washington, and I said to one of, the, uh, one of the other senators, why can't we develop a comprehensive cyber strategy? You know what the answer was? Well, you know, Angus, we got four committees, and none of them want to lose their jurisdiction. George, you remember that nonsense. Committees defend their jurisdiction, and in the meantime, we can't get an answer done. And it's, it's frustrating and it's damaging because it's coming. It's coming. Our financial system, our energy system, our gas pipeline system is all vulnerable to some kind of cyber attack. The good news is we're the most advanced technological country in the world. The bad news is we're the most advanced technological country in the world because we're the most vulnerable. We're asymmetrically vulnerable because we're so wired. And we have to be thinking about how to defend ourselves, but I believe also we have to develop a strategy of deterrence. It can't simply be we're going to patch our software every two months. Our adversaries have to understand that if they attack us in a cyber realm, there will be some response. It may not be cyber, it may not be missiles, it may be sanctions, it may be anything, but there has to be some response. Otherwise, we'll just keep getting poked. And I'll, div uh, I'll stop just, uh, I'll divert just for a minute on the, on the whole Russia question, because I'm very much involved in that in the Intelligence Committee. What the Russians did last summer in our election was entirely consistent with what they do all over the world. They are doing it right now in France. They are doing it right now in Germany. And they did it here, and they're going to do it again. And as my friend Marco Rubio keeps saying to his colleagues, Putin is not a Democrat or a Republican. He's an opportunist. And this time, he helped the Republican. Next time, he could be helping the Democrat if it suits his needs. That's why it's so important that this be dealt with on a bipartisan basis, not as a partisan fight, but as something that, is, that we can do uh, to protect ourselves as a society. 
because they're going to keep doing it. The part of what they did that really worries me that's gotten the least publicity is they probed into our state election systems, registration systems, voting systems. They, as near as anybody can tell, they were unsuccessful. They didn't, couldn't change votes, fine. But they weren't doing it for fun. They were doing it to learn something. They were doing it for practice. And they're going to continue to do it if we don't develop the ability to protect ourselves. Imagine the chaos that this country would have been in if we had found two or three days after the election that the Russians had changed a couple of hundred thousand votes in Wisconsin and Michigan. Imagine that. I mean, it didn't happen. All the, all the research and intelligence indicates it did not happen. I want to be clear on that. But what if it had? Or what if it happens next time? Because they don't necessarily want to influence who gets elected. They might. I think they did in this case. But by and large, what they want to do is sow doubt. They want to undermine our confidence in our own system. And they are really doing a good job of it. And this is something we had a hearing a couple of weeks ago that goes back into the 30s. Russia and the Soviet Union has had this destabilization through uh, uh, propaganda and disinformation for 50, 60, 70 years, and they're really good at it. This isn't a little sideline. They have thousands of people working on this. And it's something that we're going to have to really, really understand and pay attention to. By the way, I visited the Ukraine and Poland uh, in the spring of 16, before the, all this stuff in the election. And the first thing they, people wanted to tell us was, look out for the Russians messing around in your elections. How come? Because they've been doing it here for years. And here's something interesting. I asked them, how do you defend yourself? You can't shut off the internet. You can't cut off your TV. How do you, what do you do? They said a really interesting thing. They said that you defend yourself by the people knowing what's going on so they can take it with a grain of salt. You see something on TV and people say, oh, that's just the Russians. We've got to understand that, and that's why I think it's so important that the work we do in Washington is in public, so the American public understands and can start to say, oh, it's just the Russians. So we can understand what they're trying to do to us. That's not the whole answer, uh, but it's certainly part of us, part of it. Next war is cyber, that's number nine. Number 10, America is a world leader whether we like it or not. We just are. We have the strongest economy in the world. We have the most advanced economy in the world. We have the most advanced technological society in the world. We are a world leader. We can't retreat. There was a time when we had these two big moats around our country, Atlantic and Pacific. That no longer works. September 11th changed that. The Russian cyber attacks changed that. The, what we think is a North Korean attack on Sony Pictures changed that. We can no longer count on that. And we are engaged, and we have to stay engaged, but we have to continue to do it in an intelligent way and in a strategic way and understand where we can help and where there are limits on what we can do. So that's king on foreign policy, and I want to leave you with one thought. If there's anything consistent that I've tried to get across is that the world is radically changing. Everything is different. It's not, we can't, we have to know the lessons of history. I think that's one of our biggest weaknesses is not knowing uh, the lessons of history. If Kennedy hadn't read the guns of August, I'm not sure that the uh, results of the Cuban Missile Crisis would have come out the way they did. We have to understand history. Churchill said you have to have a historical imagination. However, nothing is ever exactly the same. Mark Twain said, history doesn't always repeat itself but it usually rhymes, <laughs> which I think is a wonderful way to put it. But we are in a time of unprecedented change. So how do we cope with change? Abraham Lincoln once said that every political thought he ever had came, was derived from the Declaration of Independence. Every political thought I ever had was derived from Abraham Lincoln. And on December 2nd, 1862, Abraham Lincoln went to the Congress because, not surprisingly, the Congress was not reacting to the Civil War as the crisis that it was, but they were treating it as sort of politics as usual. They were bickering and debating and, and, and not making 
decisions, and he was trying to shake them out of this. And at the end of his speech, he uttered what I think is one of the greatest summations or capture of how we should deal with change and think about change that I've ever encountered. Here's what Abraham Lincoln said. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty. Therefore, we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. And then here's what he said. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. We have to think in new and different ways. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? I, I wanted to excuse George because he's got to drive to Portland. He's on a six o'clock flight, if you can imagine that, tomorrow morning. I should have started by saying George Mitchell is my hero. It's true. Yes. Uh, one other thing that I think that has changed that I would love to have your comments on is that facts no longer matter. And the disinformation that's being perpetrated is also being perpetrated by the people who uh, are leaders. And uh, we're also being governed by a number of people who don't believe government has a function. So when I look at you know ways forward, those two things matter in ways that they haven't before. So I'd love to hear how we're going to how we're going to rise to the occasion here. You you uh, you covered a lot of ground. Um, <laughs> facts do matter. Facts are stubborn things, and they do matter. And the famous quote I'm sure you've heard and many of us have heard. I think it was from Moynihan who said everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but no one's entitled to their own facts. And that is a problem. One of the problems is that we all, remember I mentioned the term confirmation bias? We all tend to watch media. It used to be, when I grew up, I got all my information from one person. Who was it? Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite. Isn't it amazing everybody knew that? <laughs> Walter Cronkite. Now, we all tend to watch and get our information from places that agree with us. And you get these varying pictures. You don't get a, a, an overriding set of facts. It's a real problem. Uh, and there's, you know, what can, you can't ban a network or th that kind of thing. I think part of it is, goes back to education. We have to educate our young people about being more discriminating about what passes for facts. We're, we're not very good uh, consumers of particularly digital information because we all grew up with this idea, if you see something in print, there was an editor and somebody who, you know, checked the facts and all those things. Now, it's, if it's online, there it is. Mary has a quote in our, on our kitchen wall that says, the problem with the internet, with quotes on the internet is, you cannot determine whether they're authentic. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> uh, and and I, I really think it's the, the burden is on us as citizens well, number one, leaders have to deal in facts, I believe. But number two, citizens have to be better about discriminating between facts and misinformation. And it's only going to get worse. I mean, this, this, what we saw in the last election, the selective leaking and, and that kind of thing, uh, that's only going to get worse. The indications are thus far that the Russians had a lot of additional material on Hillary Clinton that they didn't use. They were planning to use it to destabilize her presidency. They, if they thought she was going to win. I mean, the, 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 uh, the power of this is really scary. Not only, and here's what scares me as a politician. They not only can get things off your computer, they can put things on your computer. And one of the tactics is, around the world is 
to download harmful material like pornography on your computer and then call the cops and say, you better check this guy's computer. And then you find yourself defending yourself. And so uh, it, you, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, we've, we've got to def defend the facts. And I think we've got, to, we've got to do our best to call people out when they're, when they're not factual and say, this is just not uh, the way it is. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's my job, and it's, it, but it's, it's everybody's job. It's, a, it's an accountability issue. But it does worry me that we're getting into a situation where, uh, you know, facts don't matter, and, and you, you've got everybody's sort of, it's sort of uh, everything's opinion, and therefore, who cares? Uh, uh, we can't operate that way. Our society can't operate that way. Jefferson said we can be, we don't, we don't worry if there's a falsehood as long as truth is free to combat it. But we ought to be sure that truth is free to combat it. Any other questions? I've talked an awfully long time. Professor Maisel. Thank you, Angus. Um, I'd like to actually pick up on Karen's question and, and turn it to you, your colleagues in the Senate. Um, the administration has been saying a number of things that are provably false. Uh, the president said uh, the murder rate is the highest it's been in 47 years. Uh, that wasn't recorded in the press, by most of the press, and uh, the, the press secretary said, why aren't you reporting what the president says? And, and the answer is because it's not true. Um, the, the obvious example of the size of the inaugural crowd, which is in itself trivia, but again, the president stating something is fact, which is observably, ob object, objectively false. Why is it that your, and one more point on that, which is there's nobody in the Senate on the Republican side who claims to be a Trump, a Trump Republican. They all have their own individual careers. Why are none of them standing up for things that both parties should be able to agree on? Facts being facts. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you an honest answer. <laughs> uh, I think there are two factors at work. One is that many people in the Republican Party view President Trump as a vehicle for an agenda that they've had for years, uh, whether it's tax reform or the Affordable Care Act or something. So they, they have no interest in, in damaging their horse, if you will. Uh, and secondly, I think uh, there's a political concern, fear, if you will, uh, that he'll come and run somebody against him in a primary uh, and, uh, or something like that. Those two, I think those two elements uh, are what's operating now, but you know we'll see what happens over time. Uh, and uh, and there are, I mean, there are people that are standing up. I mean, Marco Rubio, for example, I mentioned before, has been very strong on the intelligence committee work and very very uh, saying, you know, we've got to do this. It's got to be a nonpartisan basis, and this is we got to follow the facts where they lead. Susan Collins has said exactly the same thing, and. Uh, uh, Richard Burr, the chair, has, has, has said that. Uh, a, a funny story about Richard Burr, uh, he is the chair of the committee, he's in charge of this, I think, one of the most important investigations in the history of the country, and I went up to him the other day, <laughs> this is a true story, and I said, uh, I said, Richard, you're doing a great job. It reminds me of the quote from Hamilton, history has its eyes on you. And he paused and he said, I don't know if you ought to really quote Hamilton since my great-great-great-grandfather killed him. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but I thought it was a pretty funny comeback. Uh, but, yeah, you know, I, I think that's the answer, Sandy. Uh, and uh, it'll... It, It'll, it'll, uh, I, I think there'll be, it'll, there'll be breaches and, 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 and uh, I think, the, you know, if the president keeps, I think there's been some diminution. I got to tell you, I feel much better that he's got Jim Madison, H.R. McMaster, uh, and, and Kelly uh, in the positions that they're in. I just uh, spent a week reading H.R. McMaster's book called Dereliction of Duty. H.R. McMaster is the new national security advisor. As a colonel, he wrote a book about Vietnam which I recommend, it's stunning. And in fact, it almost stopped his career because it was so critical of the, of the military and also the civilian leadership of the country. Uh, but it's an absolutely brilliant book. And I keep reading it and thinking, man, I hope HR is reading his own book uh, uh, right now. Sir. 
Thank you, Senator. Um, you spoke very persuasively and powerfully about the importance for uh, presidents and leaders to know their history, their literature, their philosophy, their anthropology. Um, how important is it, say, related to the State Department, to preserve the NEA and NEH? Is the government's role in supporting uh, that kind of broad education something of critical national importance for our I security? I think it is. I think it is, and I think it's, I think it's uh, a national security issue. It's, it's, you, you, if, you, if you don't know history, you know, the old saying is you're doomed to repeat it. Uh, and history, it, I, when I taught at, a, at another college, which won't be mentioned, Bowdoin, uh, <laughs> I used to say history was condensed experience. Experience is how we learn. You learn that a light bulb is hot by touching it. That's experience. And we all can't have fought World War I, but we can learn about it from Barbara Tuchman. Or, or we can learn about Vietnam, or we can learn about the, the, the Apollo 13. And so that's why I think history is absolutely uh, uh, critical uh, in, and, and, and broader kind of cultural uh, issues. Uh, you know, the, and, and the other thing about, they're talking about defunding the uh, uh, National Endowment for the Arts and public broadcasting and, you know, they're nothing in terms of the overall federal budget. I mean, it's just, it's, it's symbolism uh, and, and I think would be an impoverishment uh, uh, to the country. And, and by the way, not apropos of your question, that's a really good question and you're right. I want to just stop, and I meant to say this at the beginning. This guy, David Green, is doing something remarkable for this community. He and I spent this afternoon walking down Main Street, and that's real leadership and insight, and I want to thank him for it, uh, because this is a vital, wonderful community. When I lived in Skowhegan, Waterville was, was where you went. I mean, you know, that was where you went for the movies or the pediatrician. And to see Waterville coming back to life, and I visited CGI down at the end of the street today, it's really exciting stuff, and it takes leadership, and that's it right there. And I want to thank you for that, David. So climate change is one of the biggest global challenges that we face. Could you give us some thoughts on where we're going to be with the Paris Climate Agreement and the U.S. leadership in that front? I think that's very much up in the air, and I don't know. I think the president came in, you know, with a kind of straightforward, we don't want uh, to deal with the Paris Accords and we're going to get out. I think now uh, my sense is it hasn't happened, and I think there's sort of some debate going on within the administration. Uh, I think uh, Rex Tillerson may understand this and, and is one of the people that's having an influence. So, uh, uh, and again, the, the Paris Accords are really a beginning, not a, not a regulatory regime, but just a, a commitment by countries around the world. And the important thing is India and China signed on. And to unravel that, I think, would be a big mistake that we're going to uh, we're gonna have to pay for. Yes, sir. You, the gentleman in the red shirt, you were up first. You go ahead. Thanks. Yes, sir. I didn't get a chance when George Mitchell was here a month ago to ask a question. I was cut off right before me. Um, yeah, Ken Burns said today in the Boston Globe that the issues of the Civil War are still with us. So uh, how can we be pointing fingers and the, saying, the, you know, the pot calling the kettle black, saying we don't have ourselves centuries or century and a half old grudges in this country and that show no signs of abating about the Black Lives Matter issue. I just saw the movie Selma in the next building last night. And is the West really better? I mean, that's what we're touting here, that capitalism is, is this great shining uh, city on the hill. And, and there's the evils of capitalism. And then there's the evils of socialism. So is there another new paradigm shift? Is there, do these old models really work of the dominator model versus the partnering model, the extractive economies of, of sucking everything out of the earth? by slave labor, uh, even to our shrimp from Thailand. So really, uh, what would be, there be to replace it? You know, some, some good uh, feminism and, and labor groups and cooperatives and so on and so forth and, and uh, getting minorities involved and people of color all over the world. And uh, our own feet are, are made of clay. We have our own Achilles heel. And uh, what also, uh, what should we be paying attention to now is the single overriding issue for our 
immediate and ultimate survival and the coming tests we know are coming uh, that we need to be paying attention to and uh, what, how can we all share in this and what do we need to do? I guess that's enough. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Let me sit down. Uh, uh, no. Um, I think, and I thought this the day before the election, when I thought Hillary was going to win, and I thought it the day after the election, I think one of the greatest needs we have in this country right now is what I call eloquent listening. We're not listening to each other very well. And we have to understand why, I mean, you know, I voted for Hillary, uh, but something like 60 million people voted for Donald Trump. And we can't just dismiss those people just as the Donald Trump voters can't dismiss those who voted for Hillary. We have to try to understand each other and listen better. And, and uh, I feel that's one of my jobs as a politician. Uh, I had a session down in Portland a couple of weeks ago on the Gorsuch nomination where we had over 600 people uh, and, and everybody got to speak. Everybody that wanted to talk, 70, over 75 people spoke. And, uh, and people seemed to feel good just because they were heard. We went home and Mary said, well, what'd you think? I said, that was a four hour therapy session <laughs> for all of us. And so all the questions the gentleman raised uh, are legitimate ones, but I think uh, if there's an overriding problem in the country right, right now is that we're not, we're talking past one another and we're not listening to each other and we're not, uh, we're not understanding the legitimacy of other people's point of view. Uh, in, in my experience, uh, for example, uh, I don't know if Lori Lachance is here, I saw her earlier today, she's the president of Thomas College. For example, we all want to look for the single solution, right? If we just do tax cuts, that'll solve it. Or if we just do regulatory reform, or if we just stop global climate change, everything will be good. Lori was one of my favorite images was she said, there's rarely a silver bullet, there's usually silver buckshot. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? A lot of small solutions that will help us to solve the problem instead of going into arm camps or metaphor and you know image wise arm camps and 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 uh, shooting angry uh, tweets across it at one another uh, we really need to start listening to each other and understanding that people have legitimate uh, points of view my father said even the worst person can serve as a bad example <laughs> okay. sir Senator King, I wanted to take the chance to ask you about a really complex uh, foreign policy issue, uh, the war in Yemen, U.S. involvement in the war in Yemen. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to just give two sentences as a context to my, to my question. Uh, the United States is actively selling arms, refueling uh, jets it's used Saudi. by the Saudi coalition, providing them intelligence, uh, but the United Nations has identified destruction of infrastructure for moving food and humanitarian assistance around Yemen and deliberate blockage of movement by the coalition as the main cause in a famine that could kill seven million people. Do you, could you please clarify your position on U.S. involvement in the war in Yemen, specifically further arms sales to Saudi Arabia and President Trump's proposal for direct U.S. participation in the Saudi-led coalition? I think it's a mistake. Uh, I think, again, it's another exceedingly complex, as you know, Al-Qaeda's there, the Houthis, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and I think we need to, to uh, really have deep thought before we get further engaged, and I think we should have a review of our current policy uh, because uh, we can't be complicit. Uh, and, and that's a, uh, I think, you know, we can't avoid our responsibility by saying, well, we, d we, don't, we don't know where that jet fuel went. Uh, and I think that's a, a role that we, we have to play. Now, again, to, you, you focus on the Yemeni problem, but then you say, okay, but we need the Saudis' help with ISIS in northern Iraq, or, and that's why it really gets, that's how it starts to get more complicated. It's the same thing as, you know, the Russians, if they could 
if we could work with them to get rid of Assad and then they could help us with ISIS, that would, and so it's, it's impossible to say that they're always my enemy or always my friend, uh, but I do think the, the, the role that we're playing in Yemen is due for some serious review. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for speaking, and it was really nice to hear your comments about your disapproval for the State Department um, funding cuts, um, and because there's so many important programs that come out of the State Department, and one of those programs is um, for maternal and child health, and so I guess my question for you is, will you support funding for maternal and child health by signing on to Senator Collins' letter? Um, and conveniently, I also have a copy of the letter for you. That wasn't a setup, was it, my daughter? <laughs> Thank you. That was easy. Let's take one more, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go home. You all have been very patient. Sir. Thank you, Senator King. Um, I wanted to ask you about North Korea. Um, so listening to your talk, I was thinking how we could apply your 10 principles you were talking about to the North Korea situation. To the extent that they have you know, vibrant culture, we can try and understand that, and we can understand our history knowing what happened in the Korean War after we went past the 37th parallel. Um, but it seems that the North Korean regime is intent on getting a nuclear weapon. It's their way of preserving it. They think that the United States and other countries are intent upon you know, taking over their regime. And you know, obviously this has been in the news lately. Can we achieve a, a deterrence with a regime like North Korea that's so insulated from the world that we know so little about? And if they're able to put a nuclear warhead on an ICBM and reach the west coast of the United States. Is that something that's feasible or are we going to have to take some more serious action and what would that entail? Thank you. That's a, that's a really good question and, and there are a couple of answers. One is deterrence has worked for 75 years. There hasn't been a use of a nuclear weapon since Hiroshima and it's mostly been because of the deterrence and people on both sides knowing what the awful consequences would be. The, di the problem is deterrence presumes rational actors on both sides. And the question is whether uh, uh, King, King Hyun Jun Un is a rational actor. Now, I can tell you what I've learned from the intelligence community is they believe that he is. That he may be volatile and unpredictable, but he's not crazy. And that he understands the concept of national suicide. So I think deterrence can have an impact. The problem is he, and again, this is, we've got to try to think like him. He sees this as the key to his survival of his regime and international prestige, et cetera. Uh, he's not going to give in to threats from us, I don't think. The path to solving North Korea, in my view, runs through China. China is North Korea's patron. And without China, North Korea would be unable to survive, in, in what I understand, in terms of their economy. So China has to, China is now weighing, China's not happy with what's going on, in my understanding, but they also don't want to see the regime fall and South Korea take over and they have a Western ally right on their border. So they're sort of weighing that. At some point, they're going to have to decide the danger outweighs the the danger of greater uh, liberalization, if you will, of North Korea. Here's one of the other complicating factors. I started by talking about how complicated things are. Seoul, Korea is closer to the border of North Korea than we are to Bangor. It's 40 miles. The North Koreans could take out Seoul, 15 million people, with just artillery. They don't need missiles, rockets, or an army. They could practically do it with catapults. It's so close. And so 
even if we attacked in some way, Seoul would almost in inevitably be uh, under an incredible artillery barrage that would be destructive. Millions and millions of people would be killed. So that's why this is such a, 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 a fraught situation. And I think we need, we do have to have some lines, but as President Obama learned, you better be careful with red lines. Because if you say this is a red line and then you don't act on it, then you've harmed your credibility and your ability to, to take further action. To me, we need to be resolute, but we also need to be working very closely with the Chinese because I think that's uh, where the solution lies. Um, and uh, again, to go back to the beginning of my conversation, I'm really worried about a misunderstanding. Uh, the example I used was, we're moving an aircraft carrier. We view that as a show of force. What if he views it as an incipient attack and he has to respond? Then you see that you've got a very, very dangerous situation because if there's an attack on that aircraft carrier, then there's an escalation on our side. So I wish I could give you a really simple, clear uh, solution, but I think we do need to be resolute, but we need to be pressing in every way we possibly can through the international community, but particularly through China, um, to try to uh, ease this problem. And in the past, this gentleman's father and grandfather used this nuclear thing as a bargaining uh, uh, ploy, and, you know, more foreign aid or uh, something else, and I don't know, this, this fellow doesn't seem to be moving in that, uh, in that direction. He's, he's very intent, and uh, it's, it's, there's no question this is one of the most dangerous situations that we've faced possibly since uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. On that happy note, <laughs> thank you.